So as I mentioned before, we've got three fantastic uh, speakers this evening. They're going to be talking all about recovering uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, John's going to correct me on my pronunciation in a moment, um, New Zealand's ray of sunshine, the hee hee, back from the brink of extinction. Um, and to kick off uh, proceedings, I'm going to hand over now to John. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, awesome. Right, so I will share my screen. So we've got that in, in preview. Okay, well, uh, kia ora koutou. Welcome everybody. Uh, to this, this fellows event uh, with the topic looking at how ZSL has been involved in help in recovering Aotearoa New Zealand's ray of sunshine, uh, the, the hihi, uh, from the brink of extinction. And it's my pleasure to be hosting uh, this event tonight. And uh, how we're going to run it is three of us uh, are going to give some presentations about the work that we're involved in with HIHI in New Zealand, and then we'll open it up to some to questions that we hope we can answer. And so I'm going to be uh, kicking off the proceedings. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow in the Institute of Zoology at ZSL. And what I'd like to do is actually um, maybe well, show off a little bit about ZSL's role in, in the recovery of hihi in New Zealand and also learning some interesting biological knowledge or facts about behavior and ecology and evolution in the species. So I want to show off a little bit about ZSL. I want to share some amazing facts about hihi and try and tie many of those back to, to work that ZSL has been involved in. And following on from, from me, uh, Dr. Caitlin Andrews will be presenting on some of her PhD work, uh, looking at the role, the important role that he, he play in New Zealand's forests. And this work is, is hot off the press. Caitlin was a PhD student uh, at ZSL uh, and at the University of Cambridge. And she successfully defended her, her PhD to do a viva less than two weeks ago. So this is, this is this is information hot off the press. Uh, and then we follow that up with Dr. Stefano Canessa, who will be explaining how we best use science and how we make the very best possible decisions when it comes to, to management and recovery of the species. So to start, uh, it's quite fun just to, to reflect on, on the role that ZSL has played uh, in work with HIHI in New Zealand. So ZSL's involvement started way, way back in 2004. Uh, and that was because I came across to ZSL as a postdoctoral research fellow back then, and I haven't left. Uh, and over the years, more and more people have got involved in this long-term project. You can see here the number of staff in the Institute of Zoology that have been involved with some aspect of, of hihi ecology or conservation. Um, over this time, we've had many student projects, postgraduate projects come through on the, pro on the program. So lots of MSc students, uh, a lot of PhD students have come through and studied some aspect of hihi ecology. Uh, so over this time, uh, a lot of science has been done. Uh, you can see that here we've counted 56 uh, journal articles in, in scientific journals across that time that have included uh, some uh, ZSL researcher. Uh, you can see along the top there some of the, the journals that we've published in where we've been lucky enough to get some stunning images of, of Hihi on the cover. Uh, so not only have we had a lot of science which has been done. Um, the science has been quite impactful uh, and is, is very high quality. And, and again, just to show off some of, of, of the, the roles and the people that have been involved, uh, I've got two students in particular here to focus on. Uh, on the bottom right, you can see Eleanor Chauvenet, who did her PhD at the Institute of Zoology and Imperial College London. And she was awarded the RSPB Conservation Science Award in 2014 for an outstanding PhD. And as another example, we have Dr. Kate Richardson, pictured down on the bottom left. 
She was an affiliated student, at, uh, PhD student at the Institute of Zoology. She was based down in New Zealand at Massey University. And uh, her thesis made the Dean's List at the University in 2016 um, as one of exceptional quality in every respect. So I think ZSL should be very proud of the amount of work, academic scientific work, it's contributed to HeHe he conservation and knowledge, uh, and also for producing a, a large number of, of trained students and future conservation biologists, which are now out there around the world working in, in various different conservation projects. So it's a, a fantastic um, kudos for ZSL there, I think. Now, um, to give some context of, of what's happened over the time that ZSL has been involved, I figured I would take us back in time in New Zealand to 2004 and the situation that he, he were facing at that point. And so uh, you can see here on the map of the North Island of New Zealand, uh, there were three populations of hihi that were extant at that time. There was one remnant population on an offshore island of Hauturu, Hauturu Otoi, and there were two reintroduced populations, one on Tiritiri Matangi and one on Kapiti Island. So if we fast forward to 2020, you can see that things have uh, somewhat changed uh, and improved. So now you can see that there are a number of additional populations spread across the northern half of New Zealand. You can see where they are, and you can see the population size of adult birds in each of those places. And that is because we monitor every hihi population very closely, and we know a lot about each one of them. And again, ZSL in some way or other has been involved with uh, each one of these populations. So uh, we are having success, we are recovering the species and we are now finding them back throughout their historic range. So before I get into anything very particular about hihi, I just wanted to give uh, another context which I, I hope that you might find interesting. Uh, and that is how conservation has worked in New Zealand. So um, if we go back a couple of decades, uh, or, and, and it still remains true today, New Zealand has been very lucky because it has lots of islands and it has lots of islands off the coast of the mainland of New Zealand. And classically what we've done is been able to clear these islands of invasive pest species, mammalian pest species, and then put our native biodiversity back. And in doing so, these things often are successful and we restore populations of, of critically endangered species or threatened species such as the hihi. This island here is Tiritiri Matangi. Um, both Caitlin and I have spent a, a lot of our lives on this island. It's a beautiful place. Now, um, <clears throat> and hihi is certainly there. Now, the work that was done in this sense was largely run by the New Zealand government through its Department of Conservation. Jumping forward in time, what's happened over the last couple of decades is a, a major shift in how conservation is, is largely done back at home. And so here what was, what's happening is that we're moving conservation back onto the mainland. So we're taking remnant patches of forest. We are then clearing the invasive mammalian species from them and we're putting our native biodiversity back. This obviously requires putting in some level of predator control or pest control. Uh, often with these barrier fences, as you can see in this picture. Um, this is an example from the central North Island of New Zealand, Mangatautari Ecological Island. It is over 3,000 hectares in size, and it has a 47 kilometer long predator-proof or multi-mammal barrier-proof fence um, surrounding it. And we have reintroduced hihi into the site. You can read about that in an open access uh, article in Conservation Evidence if you're interested. And you can see on the inset there that these types of projects are exploding across the country. And what else is very interesting about this is that most of them are actually run by the community. So it's community conservation groups which are leading this conservation charge. Uh, and so we're having a shift in where conservation is happening and who is doing it. And many, many more New Zealanders are directly involved uh, with conservation as a result. So it's, it's exciting. Now tonight, I wanted it to be about hihi. So uh, 
I was challenged to how we could summarize uh, lots of information about HIHI and the role that ZSL has played. And so what I figured that I would do is give some amazing HIHI facts across eight slides. So eight HIHI topics, and then I'll hand over to Caitlin and Stefano, who will go into much more detail about two particular aspects of, of HIHI and HIHI management. Uh, and so I hope that this, this will work. Uh, my first uh, hihi fact that I wanted to express was around Matauranga Māori, so uh, Māori view uh, of, of the world and of hihi in particular in this case. So hihi is a Māori name for the bird and it translates more or less to ray of sunshine. And importantly, it's associated with those first rays of sunshine of the day, so the health giving rays of sunshine of the day. And the photo in the background, I think you can make out, this is a photo taken by a volunteer on one of the populations. And you can see the, the streak of yellow that you get as the male is flying through the forest, which brings this, this, this sunshine element out. Uh, the other, well, and, and because of that actually, the, the groups that work on HIHI in New Zealand, and including us at ZSL, would really like HIHI to become a, a symbol of the challenges and hope for conservation of New Zealand's forests. So this little ray of sunshine can become somewhat iconic. The other story, which is quite interesting, uh, is one which shows more of the cheeky side of, of a HIHI nature. And so uh, according to Maori myth, HIHI refused to fetch water for Maui after he had tamed the sun. So Maui threw the hihi aside and it landed in the fire, burning its feathers. So thus the black and yellow feathers of the hihi are a permanent reminder to its lessons learned. And we'll come back to uh, the evolution of plumage color in hihi very shortly, because we have some other stories about what those plumage signals mean. My second point, hihi are rare. I think you may well have guessed this from my earlier slides. Uh, Hihi are more rare than the brown kiwi in New Zealand. And this is a fact that surprises many New Zealanders when we say it. There are only a few thousand of them, adult birds that is. So that means they're considered nationally endangered by New Zealand's threat classification system and vulnerable by the IUCN red list. Now hihi were once found throughout the northern half of New Zealand, but had declined from everywhere except that remnant offshore island population on Hauturu Otoi by 1890. Fact three, hihi conservation is challenging. There is a lot of effort and work that goes into recovering hihi and it's ongoing. We'll hear a lot more about that from Stefano a bit later. So hihi recovery is led in New Zealand by the government's department's hihi recovery group. And more recently, we've opened a Hihi Conservation Charitable Trust, which we can use to generate resource to support the, the management actions recommended by the recovery group. In both cases, the membership is made up of Department of Conservation, so government employees, iwi, so Maori representatives, community groups and researchers, which is where ZSL fits in. ZSL has been a member since 2004, and I've actually chaired the recovery group since 2012. Our main way of conservation and recovery for the species is conservation translocation, so reintroducing birds to where they've been lost before, and then supporting those establishing populations. And uh, what we consider critically important is embedding our science into the management um, to be successful in this recovery road. Uh, Stefano will talk much more about this very shortly. Four. One of the challenges that come from trying to recover hihi is that it looks like they lack adaptive potential. And so this is recent work that's come out and led by the genetic experts on the group and from uh, Dr. Patricia Breck at the Institute of Zoology and colleagues. And their work has shown that the hihi that we have left now um, have very little genetic diversity. They've shown evidence that there is selection on a number of the phenotypic traits, so uh, some of the size of the birds and some of their behavior, um, yet there is very little heritability in those traits and very little additive genetic variance, which means that they have very little potential to adapt to any future challenges that they may face. This is something um, that we need to keep in mind, given that we're facing a very uncertain and certainly changing future. Five, hihi are unique. So when I started at ZSL, 
Pihi were considered a honey eater. So they were in the family Malophagidae, which is a very speciose family in Australasia. There are currently 67 extant species recognized. So we uh, were, we got involved here in some research looking at the, the phylogenetic relationships of this bird because of some strange phenotypes that they had. And we discovered in fact that they were not honey eaters, not even closely related to honey eaters. And in fact, represented a radiation of birds from within New Zealand. And this work plus subsequent work has elevated hihi to be the sole representative of an endemic bird family, the Nodium mystidae. Six, hihi have colorful sex lives. Uh, this is probably the more well-known facts about this little known bird um, because it captures people's attention. So again, research that we've led through uh, ZSL has shown that 68% of all young that hihi produce are the result of extra pair copulations. And these illegitimate young are found in nearly 90% of the nests. Hihi are also the only bird known to copulate in a face-to-face -face position. That's not what the underlying picture is. The underlying picture is two males having a fight during the breeding season. And this is because they become incredibly aggressive. During the breeding season, the testes of the males become huge, weighing up to 1.73 grams. At this time, the testes of the male are bigger than his brain. Pretty crazy. Point seven, he here also very colorful, and this is quite unusual in New Zealand's avifauna actually, it's one of the more colorful of the birds. And a PhD student who came through, Leila Walker, uh, studied aspects of this, and she found that the male plumage uh, is providing signals to multiple receivers and that this might explain the multicolored appearance uh, of, this, of this bird. For example, she found that the yellow plumage was the result of male-male competition, whereas the black and white plumage was the result of both male-male competition and also an element of female choice. And finally, uh, I'm gonna close with the last point, which is he he are not only beautiful and special in and of themselves, but they're incredibly important to New Zealand's forests. I'm not gonna say much more about that now because I'm gonna hand over directly to Caitlin who studied aspects of this for her PhD. Um, so thank you for listening. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand over to Caitlin now. Thanks, John. I'll just um, share my screen so you all can see my presentation. All right. So hopefully you can see that, but feel free, someone signal me if you can't. Um, so as John said, I um, have just kind of been finishing up my PhD at uh, Cambridge and Zetasel, and I've been very fortunate to spend the last four years working with Hihi. And today I'm going to be talking specifically about their role in pollination. Um, but first, I'd just like to acknowledge that this work would not have been possible without um, my collaborators, Sandra Anderson and Karen Vanderwalt, who contributed um, a lot to these pollination studies, and my two supervisors, Rose Tharagood and John Ewan, who you just met. Oh, and I'm trying to change slides. There we go. Um, so we can't talk about hihi, as John mentioned, um, without talking about translocations. Seven of the eight hihi populations we have today are the direct result of these efforts, where birds are moved from existing populations to new areas to found new populations in the hopes that they will flourish. So all you have to do is look at any of our reintroduced populations to see the success of these efforts in the world in, in the form of the world's cutest baby birds, and I'm not biased there, they really are. Um, but translocations have other goals. So as John mentioned, he, he are important to the forest. They're important pollinators of native plants, many of which are threatened themselves. So when we put he, he back into a habitat, we hope that it will benefit the wider ecosystem. But while we know that translocations succeed in their species recovery goals, we don't know as much about how well they succeed at these ecosystem recovery goals, which is something that I set out to look at with my PhD. So I'm going to tell you about um, one study first, 
Um, so this is a pollination study that we did across four sites around the North Island of New Zealand. And we focused on Hihi's pollination of hangi hangi, which is a common native plant. So two of the sites um, that were part of the study are places where he, we've already reintroduced hihi. And two of them are sites where hihi remain absent. And at each site, we selected 30 plants and exposed flowers to one of two treatments. Some flowers were covered with a wire mesh to exclude birds, so they were only pollinated by insects. And some were left open so that birds and insects could both pollinate them. And so what did we expect to find here? Well, we expected that at the hihi sites, birds would improve pollination outcomes significantly, while at the non-hihi sites, birds should improve pollination, but less significantly because our superstar hihi pollinators are missing. So we let the pollinators work their magic, and then we came back later in the season and counted the fruits that formed on each branch. And to our surprise, our results were actually the opposite of what we expected. Birds helped to improve pollination at the hihi sites, but they were even more important to pollination at the non-hihi sites. So definitely not what we were expecting based on our you know, personal love of hihi and faith in them as pollinators. But sometimes high quality pollination is only evident at later stages of plant reproduction. So we decided to take a closer look at what was happening inside the fruits. So we collected a sample of fruits at each site opened them up and took a look at their seeds. And this gave us a sense of how many seeds were viable, meaning they formed an embryo. And here we found that birds improved seed viability slightly more at the hihi sites than at the non-hihi sites. There wasn't a huge difference, but this fit more with our predictions. There was still one surprise here. Overall seed viability was higher at the non-hihi sites, whether insects or insects and birds were doing the pollinating. So there are a few possible explanations for this but they don't conflict with hee he being good pollinators. So because um, we found that in both treatments, seed viability was higher, it could suggest that there's a really good insect pollinator at these sites, or it could suggest that there's something else like better water quality or nutrient availability, helping to boost seed viability. But just because a seed is viable, it doesn't mean that it will actually germinate. So we took our seeds and we let them sit for two months in the lab, and then we returned and counted how many viable seeds actually germinated or sprouted into seedlings. Here we found that birds improved germination rates significantly at the hihi sites and hardly at all at the non-hihi sites. So this suggests that hihi are helping to improve the likelihood that seeds will germinate. So to give a quick recap of the results so far, we didn't find that any evidence that hihi improved fruit set we found only a little bit of evidence that they might improve seed viability. And we found some strong evidence that hee he being present at a site improves seed germination. Now germination is a crucial stage of plant reproduction because it's ultimately what determines how many new plants result. So this shows that hee he bring unique benefits to pollination that other species may be unable to provide. That being said, being hee he uh, lovers, like we are, we were surprised that there wasn't a greater difference in pollination outcomes at sites with and without hee hee. So there are a few possible explanations that we've been thinking about. One is that ecosystems without hee hee may actually not be as broken as we thought. So another pollinator might be filling in the gap left behind by hee hee, or the plants themselves may have adapted to make use of lower quality pollination, which some of our results seem to suggest. Meanwhile, ecosystems where we have reintroduced hee hee may have other species present that could be canceling out some of the benefits that hee hee bring. But even if other species are keeping hee hee from living out their full potential as pollinators, they still have their secret superpower, which is their ability to improve seed germination. So when we translocate hee hee, we're not just helping this one species, we're also helping hee hee help the ecosystem. So we began thinking about how we might be able to help hee restore the ecosystem even more effectively, and we realized there was an important factor we hadn't yet considered. So when we translocate hee we're only bringing a small number of individuals with us, and there's growing evidence that individuals can vary in their contributions to ecosystem functions like seed dispersal or pollination. So in our case, if some hee are better pollinators than others, 
then the restorative effects of translocations might depend on who we bring with us and who survives. If we're able to somehow identify these superior pollinators in advance and select them for translocation, there's a chance we might be able to improve the restorative effects of our translocations. So we set out to explore this by conducting a similar pollination experiment, but this time we were just working on um, at one single site where hee has been reintroduced. And instead of comparing pollination outcomes across sites like we did before, we focused on hee territories within one site. So during the breeding season, hee are highly territorial. They'll chase intruders from their territories. So working on territories allowed us to assume that most pollination was due to the activities of the two territory holders. Alongside measuring pollination outcomes like we did before, we also introduced a novel foraging task for the two territory holders to measure several traits that are known to predict high quality pollination. So this has previously been studied in some high quality pollinators like bees and hummingbirds, but it's usually studied at the species level and not looked at the individual level. So here we presented birds with a task involving a ring of five novel flower feeders. Now, in any given visit to, these, um, to this ring of flowers, only one provided food, and it was randomly placed so the bird didn't know where it was. And each time the bird visited, we recorded the order that they probed the flowers in. So a high quality pollinator, based on work with bees and hummingbirds, should search the array systematically, typically making either clockwise or counterclockwise turns, rather than searching randomly. This helps to, them to avoid repeat visits to empty flowers and, make, and ensures that they're picking up new pollen from different plants and moving it far away from the original plant to promote outcrossing or genetic diversity. So what did we find here? Well, first we found that looking on the territory level, pollination, pollination outcomes did vary across the territories. So on some territories, pollination outcomes were really good, and then other territories, they weren't so good. Then in our novel foraging task, we also found variation. Some birds perform better than others. But there was no relationship between pollination outcomes and pollinator traits. Birds that had high quality pollination on their territories sometimes performed pretty poorly in the task. And sometimes birds that had bad pollination outcomes on their territories did really well in the task. So this raises the question of why pollination outcomes vary so much across hee territories and why we can't explain this variation with classic pollinator traits. One, one possibility might be that these traits simply don't translate to pollination quality at the individual level. I mentioned that this has usually been studied at the species level. Overall, he, he did really well in the task, which fits with our image of them as good pollinators, but there might just not be enough variation at the individual level to explain the variation we see across territories. So there might be another behavior that we haven't found yet that could explain this variation. And one idea we've been exploring is territoriality. So from a hee's perspective, being highly territorial means that you have exclusive access to your mates, you're chasing off potential intruders. But from a pollination perspective, it might be detrimental because those intruders could potentially bring in pollen from other areas of the site. So this is something we'd like to continue to explore in the future. Because ultimately, we know we have this superstar pollinator species, but if we can potentially identify superstar individuals, then we might be able to restore the ecosystem faster and even more effectively in future translocation efforts. So just to wrap up, I want to thank the following people for their support in the field and thank all of you for listening. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, Okay, so we will keep pushing forward and I'd like to hand over to Stefano, if he can share his screen and then I'll let him tell you all about how we go about making decisions for conservation in Hihi. Thanks, Stefano. Thanks, John. You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so thanks everyone for listening. I'll briefly tell you the story of the last decade in which John, myself, and a few other people have been applying methods from a very specific field of science to help um, planning the recovery of the hee and making sure it's, um, 
it's well thought out. So saving the hee hee means making choices, lots of decisions at every step. Some of them are intuitive, uh, the things we don't need to think about too much. Some of them are really complicated. Mm, where do we take hee hee for, from for translocations? Where do we put them? How and what do we feed them? Um, how do we monitor them? And what do we do with the data we collect? And so these decisions, the easy ones and the complex ones are a bit like the ones we face in everyday life. And in our daily lives, we make many decisions intuitively, but others are complex. And increasingly, we rely on methods from scientific methods to help us make those decisions. They can be at the individual level. We can use uh, search engines and algorithms to help us decide if we should travel uh, back when we could travel um, by bus, train or plane for the next holiday. Um, what's the probability that it rains today? And then at a larger scale, um, how should the government plan healthcare or, um, or how should the economy works? And I think we've all seen what happens when, um, for example, healthcare decision, decisions are not um, made rationally. So I'm gonna give three examples where the science of making decisions has been applied to HEHE over the last decade. And the first problem uh, we faced, I think, uh, was 2013, was a very simple um, approach to a very specific but difficult problem. Hihi on Kapiti Island, like many populations, I think like almost all populations to date, have been receiving supplementary feeding. So to help Hihi establish a nice healthy population at a site that maybe is recovering, um, we give them a little bit extra food. So basically uh, nectar or sugar water. And as the population grows, the, the effort required to give them all the food they want is considerable. And it becomes a bit too much, especially at sites like Cavity Island that have very um, steep and difficult topography. So at this stage, the managers of this site um, didn't quite know what to do. They felt and they knew the effort of giving food to he um, was becoming too much, but they were afraid to change because this could um, jeopardize the recovery of the species. It, if, as they think, the, the food is important. So they came with this question, should we keep feeding as it is, knowing that it's almost unsustainable? Should we stop feeding altogether or should we change to some intermediate level? And the approach we used was a tool that's called multi-criteria decision analysis that's been devised to, um, to find solutions where we have difficult, different things to trade off. And so in this case, what we did was get managers of the site and a few experts from the recovery group around the table and ask them to write down what they were thinking and make a very clear distinction between their values, so the things they thought were important to achieve. And in this case, as you can expect, it was mostly the number of hee hee, uh, the probability that the hee hee would go extinct. So that's something you want to avoid and costs on the other hand. And then we listed a few possible options from stopping food altogether to keeping as it is to some intermediate options. And we asked them to make predictions. So basically to tell us what they expected would happen under the different strategies, how many he he we would get and how much money we would spend. And then essentially, I'm not going to go into details that we can discuss in the uh, Q&A session, but basically we had an average of the, um, of the possible outcomes across cost and number of he he and extinction. And it turns out some actions were just poor. They were more expensive and would give fewer birds. So they were discarded. Some actions were unacceptable, like stopping food or removing the hee hee altogether would, yes, cost zero money, but we would have no hee hee left. So that was not a good option. And in the end, the best options, there were a couple of them. In the end, they were similar. And so we just picked the, um, 
the easiest one to implement, which was to change the arrangement of feeders across the island so that would be easier to, to, to refill. So by putting things on paper and doing this simple method, we potentially avoided a discussion that could have been very long if people had just kept things in their head and not put them on paper. To give you an idea, this whole thing took about three hours, plus a few emails before and after the, the workshop, let's call it. For comparison, a couple of years later, we had a very different problem where the population of Hihi that had been just been established at Bushy Park was not growing. So there had been releases, but the populations were, the population was not growing the way we would like it and expect it to. So again, we had a dilemma. Should we put more birds in? This could improve the situation, so we could boost the population. But if there is some, something fundamentally wrong with this place that we don't know about, we're just wasting birds. And taking birds from one site to put them somewhere else is going to impact that source population, right? We are subtracting birds. So what do we do? Do we just abandon the site altogether? Should we actually take birds and put them at Bushy Park to try and boost the population? Or should we maybe stop, wait a couple of years maybe to see what happens? Again, you can see there are trade-offs and there are uncertainties here, and it was a bit too much to decide intuitively. And so we turned to a tool that's called stochastic dominance analysis that has, I think, a very fancy name, but it's commonly used in economics, for example, to decide what to do in the face of risk. Essentially, you can imagine we had a very complex biological model that described the, um, the dynamics of different populations with different numbers of birds, different survival rates, and essentially took all those multiple results from the complicated model and condensed them to a single graph. Again, we can discuss the specifics in the Q&A section, but the message here is this allowed us to look at all the possible scenarios and see how many of them would result in a bad decision. It turns out in 80% of those scenarios, the best thing to do was not to release any extra birds. There were 20% of those scenarios where it was best, it would be better to release birds, but actually it didn't make much difference. So even if we did, it wouldn't improve the situation so much. And so in the end, again, the decision was relatively straightforward. Just wait, not release for the time being and see what happens. And I think the population is now, that's what happened, that's what was done. And the population is now, I think, doing better. So again, this extra analysis helped us interpret a biological, a complex biological system in light of what we wanted to achieve. This process uh, that's been um, published a couple of years ago in, a, in the journal took about, took a few months. Okay, in comparison to the three hours in the previous in the previous example. And the final one is the most ambitious so far, where as, as the HIHI program grows, as John mentioned, there are more and more populations, more and more sites, each with their own decisions about whether to feed birds, whether to take birds, release them, and so on. And most of the decisions had to be made under uncertainty. We don't know what will happen if, for example, we stop feeding at this place. We don't know what will happen if we release birds at this other place, although it looks good. And so you can imagine that being very conservative and only doing things that we know work at sites that we know are good for hee hee, it's probably not gonna fail, but it's not very ambitious. Hihi are not going to grow so much, and especially we're not going to learn very much. Whereas, for example, taking food away could lead to a single population failure, but it could teach us something very important for the future and for other sites. And so how do we balance this, this need to be ambitious and to learn against our desire not to, to minimize failures? And this is what we call adaptive management. Okay, finding this optimal balance of, balance of science and management where science can help management, but management is reluctant to invest everything into science. Essentially, here the idea is to build a big, um, a big software 
um, program that considers many of these possible strategies. For example, ones where we are very aggressive in learning, we release the sites that might not be optimal to learn about, for example, the requirements of HIHI against strategies that are more conservative. And essentially, the program simulates the future of HIHI. So the next 20 years of what could happen, what, what could populations do? What could we do? How could we monitor populations? What data could we collect? How would we use those data? And it does this for thousands and thousands and thousands of scenarios. And the idea is that by doing this, we'll find that optimal or best balance of learning and doing. And as you can see, we've, we've um, increase the complexity of the examples and here this software has taken five years to complete it's almost done and hopefully it will inform and help HIHI recovery for the next 20 years. So to conclude um, I think John has explained this managing HIHI is difficult there are many decisions many are easy to make people are very skilled and knowledgeable but some remain difficult. Uh, there is uncertainty, many things can go wrong. And so we need that biological knowledge, for example, as Caitlin has described, um, but there, always, there will always be some uncertainty left and there will be other things that we need to balance, like costs, like cultural values, what things people want from HIHI. And these decision support tools, you can think of as an extra bit of science that you add to your biolog biological studies or to your budget estimates and you add them to help you link them and then make rational decisions and hopefully become even better at saving the heat. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, okay, so that is the set of talks from us and we've got about quarter of an hour just under to answer some questions so it's good to see Caitlin's back on here um so I've got the the chat session open and I'll try and select across the the questions so that we all get a bit of a turn at answering them um there is one question here for you Caitlin I think you can start with this one asking about um doo -doo -doo -doo, what was the evidence that the forests you studied were degraded? Sure, so I think that's referring to the first pollination study that I described across multiple sites. Um, well, there's kind of a range of different levels of degradation across New Zealand forests. There are some areas that have been completely cleared for farmland and then replanted. Um, so like Tiri Tiri Matangi, the main study site, um, that I've worked on with Hihi um, is a regenerating forest, which is the result of lots of hard work by people planting trees um, and other plants that would support birds like Hihi. Um, but actually in this study, one important thing to mention is that we tried to select sites, um, uh, our Hihi sites and our non-Hihi sites. We tried to make them as ecologically similar as possible. So at a similar stage of regeneration so that the main difference between them was really the presence or absence of Hihi. Um, so they were kind of, yeah, they were at a similar kind of level of restoration. Um, but I guess just in general, some of the key signs that a forest in New Zealand is degraded is the lack of um, biodiversity in terms of uh, many of the native bird species not being able to survive in those forests. And with hihi, um, like John and Stefano mentioned, um, we have to often provide sugar water for them to support them. So they're missing some key um, food plants in the environment. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, there's a few more linked to this. Uh, have you published your papers yet on this? <laughs> uh, and when is it going to be quotable? Well, um, that is coming soon, hopefully. So I'm working on um, some revisions um, and going to submit those soon. So stay tuned. Excellent. Yeah, we're all looking forward to those papers. Um, so actually, on, on the note of the 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 quality or degradation levels in the environment or the different habitats where we're putting hee hee. Um, I don't know if, if Stefano, you want to add anything to that because this really speaks to that adaptive management program that you finished your presentation on. 
Sorry, I was I was typing an answer to another question. Can you can you repeat? This? I was wondering if you wanted to add anything uh, linked to the adaptive management framework that you're developing around our learning mm, about yeah. uh, habitat degradation or habitat quality, what it means from a hehe perspective. Yeah. Um, I think what, John, we, what, what John's referring to in this is that idea of learning. Um, our knowledge, we, this is part of the adaptive management um, plan that we are developing, is this, that our knowledge of the exact, the exact requirements, what makes a site good for HIHI, and how much do we have to supplement, for example, by providing food. These are things that are uncertain and so if we if we base ourselves on the things that we we are sure that work like feeding seems to work um releasing at sites that we think are good um, you know we're, we're not going to be very we're not going to be very ambitious and the program is going to become expensive so maybe there are conditions that could be good we just have to try but that risks um, failure. And so this is the idea, trying to balance between what we think works and what we think could work, but we'd be reluctant to try and try to find a solution to that in the planning phase rather than having to do it um, just by trial and error. Is that what you... Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, he he recovery is... is um, We've got a formula that we know more or less works, and that means we feed every reintroduced population. They're all reliant on supplementary food. Uh, we do not, therefore, know whether there is a suitable habitat left in New Zealand for them without feeding because we've never tested it very well. And so this whole um, adaptive management framework is trying to move us into the space because we would much prefer he he to be living naturally in the environment not under constant uh, human care and management. Um, so we're, we've got a lot to learn about uh, what is a good site for a hihi. Uh, there are a few things here that I can answer very quickly. Um, do we have any hihi in ZSL? Nope. Um, there are no hihi outside of New Zealand that are alive. Uh, there's lots of hihi in the Natural History Museum, but they're in a drawer. Um, there is a small captive population in New Zealand, but it is uh, it was set up a long time ago and it's very difficult uh, to manage them in captivity. They have lots of problems and so really it's a few birds which will not be replaced once they die. So we do not have a captive population that plays a role in hee hee uh, recovery. Um, another quick one, well maybe this is not quick actually. Which one do I go for? So there's there's lots of upvoting for a question around key lessons that we have learned from CDSL's work with hihi um, that could transfer to work with other species. And this is a really important question and one um, that I actually had a slide on, but I had to remove it because there's just not enough time to talk about this stuff. Um, hihi are becoming a model system in the field of reintroduction biology. So uh, it's certainly informing a lot of reintroduction practice globally. Um, we've got good examples where we've transferred the techniques we've, we've played with on HIHI and used to help HIHI to other systems. So I've worked uh, a lot in Mauritius and they have reached out to us because of what they've seen on, on HIHI and we've applied exactly the same methods and tools uh, in things like Mauritius olive white eye conservation. Um, I don't know if, if Steph, know you want to add anything around um, the lessons learned from our research in a broader context. In terms of the methods, <clears throat> certainly the, the, the problems themselves have been instructive and the way we've had to think about them. And I can think of applications um, in probably at least a dozen different programs um, just of the, for example, the, from the software we developed, you know, the programs we wrote to the methods we implemented, um, the stochastic dominance that I mentioned in one, I think in the last three years only, we've applied it to four different species, a frog, a turtle, uh, another, uh, a frog in Europe. So yeah, 
a turtle in Italy, a bird in Mauritius, um, and the hee in New Zealand. So, yeah, I think as John said, it's it's a great model, um, mostly because it's creative in the way it, the hee recovery program is creative in the way it tries to answer answer its problems, and the problems are common to many translocations, and so it's really it's really been powerful um, in this sense. Thank you, Stefano. Um, another quick one. I know it came in the chat that Colin was asking that we never mentioned the scientific name for the for the hee hee. Uh, so it's Notiomistus cincta. I might have to type that in because my pronunciation is probably terrible, but or Stefano could add that into the chat. That would be good um, so that you've got it written down. Um, so we've got a, we've got people interested in, in Kapiti Island. Um, Rightly so, it is a fantastic place. Uh, Jim's been there, uh, that's great. Um, I did my job interview in 2003 for moving to the zoo in 2004 from the ranger's house on Kapiti Island um, over the telephone back in those days. Uh, so yes, it was incredibly difficult to remove predators from that island. Um, how was it achieved? Actually, I think when I was studying uh, conservation biology in New Zealand, the one study that I remember very clearly is the story of removing possums, so a marsupial from Australia um, that was introduced in New Zealand for fur, and it's, uh, it destroys New Zealand forests and predates New Zealand birds, and they were all over Kapiti. And um, the program to remove the possum was, um, it was impressive. It took many years, it took many millions of dollars, and um, I, I, you, you can't quote me on exact numbers. It's published. Um, I could share the paper somehow if I can find it, um, so email me. But the first 90% of possums were removed in the first year, and it cost a fraction of the full program. And it took many more years and many millions of dollars to get the last individuals off. And it just shows the, the commitment uh, and the challenge of, of eradication of, a, of an invasive species. Um, more recently than that, we've got images of possums floating on logs just off the coast. So uh, there is a biosecurity concern. We have had incursions of thing, mustelids like stoats uh, and had huge responses to try and keep that place clean, but it is clean. Um, so it can be done and it's a big and tough island, as you say. Uh, New Zealand's quite good at, at cleaning islands of, of pests. So I hope that answers that one, but please do email me if you want the paper, because it's a, it's a fantastic paper. Um, what else have we got here? Have I got time? I've got maybe one more. There's, there's lots of people interested in relocating the birds from remnant populations. How do we select them? It's a good, really good question, uh, and there's lots of decisions again. Um, and so we've evolved how we've done it over time. These days, we do not harvest many birds from that remnant population on Hauturu. That population is precious, and we keep it safe. Uh, however, one of the reintroduced populations, Teri Teri Matangi, is very productive, and we know it has strong population growth. So we can model different levels of harvesting from that population and understand the impact that we'll have with high certainty. So we feel safe harvesting birds from that population. These days we harvest juvenile birds, um, so birds which have, have just left the nest and in the first few months of their life, and we uh, send them off on their merry way to reinforce other populations or start new ones. Every now and again we might go back to Hauturu and grab some birds for genetic purposes. Um, so that's our current method for selecting individuals for, for translocation. Um, I recognise that the time is, yes, Charlotte was about to pop up, so I can't answer anymore. I might type some answers quickly while she's rounding off. 